Our next speaker is David Dotson here to talk about Alchemiscale. Awesome, thank you, Jeff. Thanks everyone for, for coming. Yeah, so I'm gonna speak about this project that we've been running since about March or April of last year, so 2022. Um, we've had a working group uh, comprising OpenFF, OpenFE and folks from the Kadera lab. Um, it's been working on this ev practically every week uh, for the last year. So um, the fruit of that labor is Alchemiscale. Uh, so this is an open source, uh, high throughput alchemical free energy uh, execution system for use with HPC, cloud, bare metal, and folding emulsifiers. Oh, and I should introduce myself. I'm David Dotson. I'm an, in I'm an independent consultant. I work with OMSF and the Kadera Lab. So uh, that's this has been one of those major efforts for the last year. Oh, if this is working. Oh, there it is. Thank you. So. This project was uh, born out of a uh, shared need by uh, several stakeholders. So case uh, discovery, which uh, of which the Kadera lab is a part, um, needed to advance the COVID moonshot infrastructure um, into uh, the ASAP discovery infrastructure. So ASAP discovery is uh, is this uh, open science drug discovery platform, in particular for pandemic potential uh, uh, virus targets um, and uh, Basically, they, the current infrastructure that was built from the COVID moonshot just wouldn't scale to uh, the speed of iteration that uh, ASAP discovery was going to need. Open force field, we, had, we heard Lily uh, allude to this earlier, that uh, a benchmarking apparatus for protein ligand free energy calculations, um, both OpenMM and Gromax was, was desirable, basically decreasing the cycle time of iteration from a new idea for a force field to testing it to new force field. So um, being able to, to rapidly test new ideas and then rapidly benchmark uh, advancements. And then open free energy. Uh, would have liked to have a platform uh, for assessing and evolving implementations of binding free energy uh, methods, uh, different atom mapping approaches, different execution strategies, basically everything within their remit. Um, a system like this would, would be a, a huge game. And I just wanted to give the context of where Alchemist Scale sits. So the open FE ecosystem, as Richard, Richard pointed out, um, it gives a lot of workflow flexibility to users. So um, in broad strokes, what we're trying to do at all at all times, we're doing free energy calculations, is you know, we're defining the sets of uh, systems that we're interested in getting free energy differences between. So we're doing um, drug discovery, we're trying lots of different ligands for a given protein target, we're building these alchemical networks. So we're defining our networks. Then we're executing those networks. We might be using a commercial solution for that. We might be using something that we built internally, you know, something that maybe a bunch of scripts that we threw together um, and we've been using for years. That could be our execution engine. And then we also have tools for analysis, taking what comes out of execution, what comes out of the expensive part um, in order to then iterate on this process, do the whole thing again, again and again. So reducing that cycle time is, is a key component of what we're trying to do here. And the tooling that Open, OpenFE uh, draws from, so OpenFE is, a, is a, intended to be kind of a top level package for users, um, but it draws from these, these other packages listed here, like Goofy and Lomap and Cartograph. Um, these sit at the uh, defining stage, how we define the work we wanna do. Um, as far as execution engines go, OpenFE does expose some ability to execute. Uh, I'll be talking about Alchemist Scale here that sits in the execute column. And then for analysis, we have lots of other tools and, and perhaps many other I'm not mentioning here, but these are the ones that are used within OpenFE at the moment. So you might ask, why would we need different things in this execute column? Well, honestly, different tools are more or less appropriate depending on what kind of infrastructure you have access to, uh, what your constraints are within your organization, uh, Basically, there's not a one-size-fits-all solution for execution, typically. And we'll be talking about Alchemist Scale here. So what is Alchemist Scale? Well, it was in the title, but the longer definition is, it's a service-oriented execution system for alchemical networks. So these are uh, alchemical networks as defined by Goofy, uh, suitable for utilizing multiple compute resources. So HPC clusters, individual hosts, pulling it on work servers is something we to, as well, um, to support large campaigns that require high throughput. So if you just want to run a few edges, Alchemist Scale is probably not your total choice. 
if you want to run thousands of edges and many, many, many networks, perhaps across uh, multiple teams in your organization, then Alchemist Scale is appropriate. And you can use all of these resources or different variations of these resources at once with a single instance. We'll see how that works in a second. So, like I said, it uses the same core data model as all the other features using the Goofy. Um, it's deployable, at least a, a single server uh, deployment is deployable in a few steps with Docker Compose um, on AWS. Um, architecturally, uh, it uses a Neo4j graph database uh, that serves as a central state store. And this uses, uh, AWS, and it also uses AWS3 for the object stores to uh, hold on to result for that. It's basically the fat stuff that comes back from calculations. Uh, user access is provided via a Python client. So this is a, an HTTP client. Um, it talks to API services that broker interactions between or with the state and the object stores. So it's a standard kind of web services architecture. Um, these the compute services that actually do uh, that perform these kind of protocols or the Goofy model, these can be deployed on resources elsewhere, like set of HPC clusters and different hosts, and they will draw tasks from the API services, execute them, and then push the results back. And we're now in production. Uh, we've been using the system now for um, several weeks. Um, the first deployment of Alchemist Scale is now in place. It's actually a shared deployment by OpenFE. OpenFF, ASAP, Discovery, and, and actually Dodera Lab by extension. Um, and so this is delivering results for us. Irfan Alabe, just wanted to highlight you, uh, went ahead and ran a combined benchmark of OpenFF 2.1 against 2.0, TIG 2, MCL1, uh, Thrombin, pif 2 a and P38. And uh, just as a scientific side, uh, because OpenFF 2.1 was just a valence refit, we weren't expecting this to really change what we get for free energy calculations against 2.0. Um, so if what we expected to see was basically the same results against both force fields. Uh, we've largely seen that here. Um, if we saw something different, we'd be concerned. We do have some outliers that we're now looking into, but that speaks to the, the power of this approach is that Irfan was very easily able to just declare what he wanted to run, submit it to the instance, and pull results back down, and then iterate. So I'll talk a bit about how it actually works. We already talked about some of the components, but for now, there's a bit of a diagram. Um, so this is your user workstation. This would be you, the user. Um, you can define alchemical networks. Here's the client. So as I said, users interact with an alchemical skill deployment via the client. And you can define an alchemical network using uh, open a feature of its underlying, it's a UV data model, it's underlying that. That whole network that you define can be submitted to uh, through the client, and that network is then represented in the state store. So it's it's fully represented in the O4J and the graph database. Users, uh, you as a user can then create an action tasks for the transformations uh, in the network. So you can choose, maybe you want to run a few networks to begin with, or a few transformations to begin with. Um, maybe you want to run them all. You can kind of do whatever you want to do. And um, these are then picked up via a weighted random selection by compute services that are running on remote resources. So if you have access again to HPC clusters, maybe multiple, um, maybe a Kubernetes cluster, a container, any container orchestrator that's running these, basically whatever your resources are, you can hook them up to your Alchemist scale instance and, um, and they would serve as workers. Um, when these compute services push results, or when they finish, they push the results back to the object store. So again, the fat stuff lives in an object store. In this case, it's three, um, and it has references. Each one has a reference in the state store. But as a user, you're living up in this land. Um, basically, all you had to do was push things, uh, define your network, action tasks, and then pull your results as they become available. So all of that machinery down here is largely abstracted from. Oh, sorry. So, um, so that's the basic workflow, but I wanted to point out a few things that Alchemist Scale allows uh, or really enables programmatic and iteration or iterative evaluation of alchemical networks. So um, 
let's say you define an, an initial network. So this is something you'd like to calculate. Um, you start with something small and uh, you submit it, you action the tasks, you get results back. You decide you want to expand it. You can go ahead and do that. And if you, um, let's say this network shares a lot of chemical systems, these red dots and uh, connections with the previous one, this network takes advantage of the existing results in the database. It doesn't have to start from zero. It, it literally is just a delta on, on the, uh, uh, the existing network. And you can go further. Let's say you uh, decided later you actually just want to trim your network. So you remove some, some nodes you had, uh, and transformations you calculated previously. Um, they're still in the database, but you're just submitting a network that is a trimmed or a trimmed and expanded version of a previous one. Again, it will share results for transformations that are in common. So um, this capability um, of being able to take advantage of existing results for transformations that are already present really does enable rapid iteration and an efficient compute use. You don't have to start from zero every time. Um, you, can, you can do smaller deltas and iterate or very large deltas. Um, and Alchemiscale enables, um, it really is a multi-org, multi-user system. So there's authentication built in. This is intended to be exposed to the, to the internet. It is a web service. Um, and so let's say you have uh, two networks you submitted. Um, Alchemiscale has this concept of scope and it serves two distinct purposes. I'm gonna uh, illustrate here. Let's say we submitted these networks to the scope. It's the organization open OpenFV, it's the campaign benchmark, and it's the project OpenFV 2.0. Um, these networks, because they share, you know, certain chemical systems and certain transformations, um, they're going to uh, be able to take advantage of the same sets of results in the database. They're they're represented as the same objects because they sit in the same scope. Um, by contrast, so you have shared transformation results here. By contrast, this network, which does have elements in common with these over here, it sits within a different scope. Let's say it was submitted by someone who works for ASAP Discovery. It lives in the ASAP org in this campaign, in this project. Um, this will have its own distinct transformations despite them being identical to something that exists in the database. So there's a domain boundary. This is how we partition uh, data and users in, in Alchemist Scale. Um, so the implications of this is that users with this access to the same scopes can directly collaborate in those scopes. And users that have access to disjoint sets of scopes can't see or interfere with each other's work. So it really does allow you to, um, to work together if you'd like. So you can see the same things, work on the same pieces. But if you need to silo work, let's say you know, you're know you a discovery company and you need to partition or uh, put firewalls between certain teams, you don't necessarily need a different Alchemist scale instance for each one. You could use the same one, you just have to um, set different scopes, uh, scope accesses. So there's an example of um, uh, Irfan over there. Um, he has access to the open the star star scope, so he can hit anything within open the feed, create whatever he wants in, the, in that, as long as it matches his pattern. Um, and then let's say we also have Mike Henry, who's not here, and then Yanka, who's somewhere around here. They have access, like Mike Henry has access to these two here, and Yanka has access to just the ASAP scope. Um, Yanka and Mike can collaborate over here. Mike and Irfan can collaborate over here, um, but, but Irfan can't see, he can't even see the ASAP stuff, and Yenka can't even see the OpenFV stuff. And so um, the same system supports both sets of users, both organizations even. Um, but importantly, Mike, who has access to both these scopes, can see both. So it still allows you to very flexibly, you know, if you've got some people who are shared across organizations, they're able to, to see what they get access to what they need. So release 0.1.2 is now available. Uh, Alchemist Scale is a fully open source project. Um, it's openly developed on GitHub, you can find it here. Um, the version of 0.1x series, this is the MVP version of Alchemist Scale. Um, there are rough edges, there are performance bottlenecks. Uh, you could consider this an optimized version, right? We were aiming for uh, feature completeness, at least for the initial MVP, but not necessarily high performance. Um, and it does have insufficient documentation. Um, but it said 012 is the current patch release. So uh, check that out if you're interested. 
The upcoming 013 release is another patch release. This will focus on some initial bugs and some bug fixes, uh, some critical features and performance improvements. So our initial users of this deployment um, uh, spotted lots of things that you know they would like changed. We're uh, trying to rapidly uh, respond to that, get some fixes out, and a new release deploy, and then they can take advantage. Um, just want to say where we're going. Uh, we're coordinating effort for critical requirements and, and all the projects that Alchemiskill either uses or touches or impacts uh, via that working group. We meet every week. We operate in two-week sprints uh, through some donated effort from, from the stakeholders involved. Um, this whole system would not have been possible uh, without that working group. So it's it's been a pleasure I mean, to say like, absolutely critical to the process. And we're continuing to go to the same. Um, and the upcoming major releases will focus on, in particular, 02 will focus on docs and initial user feedback. So, filling in our documentation gap, uh, once we've done it, we ask your users. Uh, and then 03 beyond that will focus on new features, um, new optimizations, and then uh, some targeted refactors, things that will, will take some learnings and then pull the guts out of it, and put it back together in different ways. I should say the folding and foam compute service uh, that will allow us to take advantage of exascale compute for the ASAP and OMSF alchemical deployment. We'll be working on that over the coming months. Uh, this will really uh, enable us to take advantage of a massive amount of compute. I should say that at the height of COVID, um, the COVID or um, the, um, the folding at home network comprised about 1.5 exaflops. It was bigger than the top 10 supercomputers combined. And John has a great figure of it would have been, I think, $6.8 billion per year of AWS compute um, with how big of a cluster that is. So, if, <laughs> yeah, being able to have access to, to that amount of potential compute will really accelerate OMSF efforts and ASAP discoveries, open science, uh, open probe discovery efforts. So, Alchemist, I do, do want to give credit. Alchemist scale was drawing from a long line of prior art. Uh, you know, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. We get a lot of architectural inspiration from DAS, fireworks, QC fractal, and totally with that spoke bit. Um, we also got a lot of stated desires up front from stakeholders um, and potential users via the uh, user stories they provided. If you are interested in this system and you've got a problem you'd like it to be able to solve, feel free to make a user story on the issue tracker. Um, I see all of these, I tag them. Um, we can try to see if, if Alchemist Scale is a good fit for that problem. And if it isn't, we want to know about it. And to reiterate, a single deployed Alchemist Scale instance uh, is now uh, enabling continuous benchmarking of equipment at force fields, synthesis prioritization for ASAP discovery, or discovery campaigns, and it's a feedback loop for method development. That so and presumably, it can enable quite a bit more that we haven't even thought of yet. And I wanted to put this out there. If you're interested in deploying and using Alchemist Scale, uh, it's fully open source. Uh, we do welcome feedback on how easy it is to deploy and how easy it is to use. <laughs> um, if you want direct help with deployment and use, or if you'd like to evaluate it for suitability in your own environment, um, let's chat. I'm here all meeting. Um, maybe we can discuss that. And we do want Alchemist Scale to be a sustainable project. Uh, we don't want it to be some one off thing uh, that improves rapidly over time. And we do believe that uh, its adoption can help drive, um, um, it can help drive and sustain the OMSA ecosystem well into the future. And in order to realize that future, early adopters are critical. So we welcome, uh, we welcome those who are interested. Builds on a lot of work. These are the folks that have been involved in the working group for the last year. Uh, if I missed you, I'm so sorry. Uh, didn't intend it. Um, of course, there are many who've done a lot of work that this is building on top of getting to stand on the shoulders of guys. So grateful for this community, uh, the free energy workshop community that we just attended uh, the last uh, few days. All of this is built upon it. So questions. Up in front, then Julian. It's not a question, but it's very common. I just want to say that I think this this work is absolutely 
trust you. What you're doing is a very unglamorous, busy way of productionizing and industrializing the infrastructure of the times of migrations. And this has the potential to bring lots of benefits to a much wider group of users far into the future. So I'm very much in for this. Do we have any answers? So are you talk oh, uh, I do have a <laughs> are you talking about encryption at rest, encryption in transit? Um oh, what is there? Is sure. So we do, I mean, all oh uh, yeah, sorry. So Julian asked about encryption, you know. So we talked about separation of data, like can different users see each other's data via scopes, but um is the data encrypted at rest? Is it encrypted in transit? So um, communication between say the client and the API services is encrypted via HTTPS, so via TLS, um, so that's in transit. We don't encrypt anything at rest. So anything that's landed on the object store is not currently encrypted. We could add that. Um, it just means there's keys on, uh, on the API services and, and that could be done if that's of interest. Um, is, that, is that something that you would find is critical? Yeah, I, I think that would be fairly easy to add um, if encryption at rest is desired. Now, encryption in the database itself in Neo4j that can be done, but it kind of starts to make it harder to use. Uh, it makes the, the database model more difficult. But some things could be. I, I think it's a permission problem. It's just a permission. So people don't see the yeah, we current uh, so we, we currently do approach the permissions problem via the scopes mechanism. So and it's the API services that um, that um, enforce it. So even if a user hacks their client, it, it doesn't change anything. Yes, we have a running instance. Oh, sorry. The question was, have we actually de deployed an Alchemist scale instance? Uh, yes, we have a running instance. It's been running for several weeks now. Um, and it's in service uh, to OpenFF, OpenFE, ASAP Discovery. Um, it delivered the results that I, I displayed early, early on. Sure. Yep. What, what, what does it cost to run free energy on Amazon in terms of dollars? Uh, so the question was, what does it cost to run a free energy campaign on on AWS in terms of dollars? So we're not actually with this instance, we're not running any of the like GPU calculations on AWS. Um, our server, so our, our, our Alchemist Scale server instance, um, if I can go back to the architecture, uh, basically everything that was in the green box, nothing, pushing the button, nothing is happening. Nothing's happening. Anyway. Um, the um, the Alchemist Scale server is running on AWS, and we use S3. But all of the compute services are running uh, currently on MyLac, uh, which is an HPC cluster, or Pacific Research Platform, which is a Kubernetes cluster. So we're currently load balancing across two very different cluster architectures um, to deliver free energy calculations for that deployed instance. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Great. Let's go ahead and thank our speaker, David Dotson. And uh, we're just about to be able to break for lunch, I think, but um, I just wanted to take a minute to thank, because I know people will distribute tomorrow. I wanted to take a minute now while we're all together to thank OMSF for putting this on and the funding, I think, for this comes partly from the Chan Zuckerberg initiative. So, and especially OMSF at, at the org level was just Carmen only until just very recently when Mark joined. So a big hand for OMSF and Carmen and Mark in organizing. As you, as you now know, there's several projects at OMSF that have you know, their own staff, but as an org, it was literally only one person and only enough money to pay that one person. 
until a very recent. So thanks again. And we're really glad. I know OMSF and all of us are really glad to have you here. So I mean, any, anything else before lunch? Okay, thank you. I have a question. I wonder if the